Hello and welcome to Become the Teapot. I'm Ian. And so am I. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's a podcast about comic books and their adaptations. And this is our momentous 50th episode. And a big episode needs a big subject. So who better than the most iconic superhero of all time? Batman. Uh, no, not quite. Uh, he works for a newspaper. Oh, um... Spider-Man. Not Spider-Man, no. Uh, His alter ego is Clark Kent. Clark Kent, the mild-mannered reporter for the Daily Planet. He can't be a superhero. He wears glasses. That may be, but, and this may shock you, he's actually Superman. No way. Yes way. Mind blown. Well, in that case, we better talk about one of the many, many Superman films and comics. Why stop there? It's our 50th episode after all. Why don't we do two? Well, I'll do you one better. Why not three? No, two is fine. Oh, okay. Well, this episode we'll be talking about 1978's Superman along with 2013's Man of Steel. And for the comics, we're reading two separate origin stories with John Byrne's 1986 limited series The Man of Steel, as well as 1938's Action Comics and 1939's Superman, the oldest comics we've ever covered. That's a lot to get through. Well, we aren't calling it a Superman-sized special for nothing. Then there's not a moment to spare. Up, 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 and and away! away! So, I'm not going to do the traditional preamble because, well, it's Superman. If you don't know who he is, then what are you doing here and what have you been doing with your whole life? (laughs) But before we move on to the films and the specific comics, I want to start with a bit of a chat about Superman in general. So, I can see you're wearing your Superman pyjamas. I am indeed. What is your familiarity with Superman? Had you read much from him? You know, what's your overall impression of him as a character? Well, overall impression, he's, he's, he fights for truth and justice and American, and he's the classic American hero. And I've not read it a lot, so mm. that may surprise you. Red Sun's come up on the podcast a few times. It I, has. I have read that, which I actually looked back on that this morning, and I realised that's only three episodes, and three issues even, mm-hmm. which I thought was like six or eight, but it's a very short run. It is, and it's a Mark Millar run as well, one of yeah. the good ones. In, so. Well, yeah, one of the good ones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, apart from that, really... Mainly TV and film. I used to watch Smallville. We used to watch the Adventures of is it Clark and Lois. Uh, yeah, Lois yeah. Clark, whatever it was, the, the, one the New the Adventures of Superman. I think it was. Yeah, called that in this one. Country, wasn't it? Yeah. I've seen bits of the new series. Watched Supergirl. Like there's a lot of TV shows and films that I've seen Superman in. Hmm. Like I said, he is the most known superhero. I would say. Yeah. Probably the most read, most watched, most most <laughs> the most most. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's. Fair. I mean, he's been around since 1938, and he has had. Yeah radio plays tv serials you know he has been across all medium for well 90 years now so Mm. yeah he is very much you know i know that spider-man and batman are also very well-known characters but there's something about the iconography of superman that i think just means that you can show the symbol to anyone anywhere in the world and they will know who that is yeah i mean that's true i mean the s the iconic s symbol is exactly that it's iconic Mm. it's something that you could probably show someone who doesn't read comics or hasn't even picked up anything at all and you go who's this and they'd be like superman yeah no exactly right and, and everyone has their different experience like you say some people come at this through the films you know that's the first thing they'll ever see it's certainly the case for me i would have watched the films long before i read any comic books uh interestingly i picked up the book here we're reading today the man of steel in the front of that there is a, a preamble from i believe it's from john byrne where it talks about you know this is my experience from superman and uh, you know superman was invented for a 19 something radio play yeah and obviously that's not true but that is his experience with superman that is the you know, the way that he experienced it the first memory he had of it is watching the tv series the adventures of superman you know, the old black and white ones so yeah i i think it's interesting i mean let's see i would have watched the films before i read the comics mm-hmm. uh, but generally speaking the comic books i've read limited runs yeah. kind of like i had with batman with exception of a couple of longer bits but all-star superman kingdom come some of the crossover events you know crisis events and things like that 
And then I started picking up action comics when a writer I liked, I think it was Paul Cornell, started writing them and then Grant Morrison took back over. But yeah, I mean, generally speaking, my experience with Superman is in self-contained stories. Like, yes. you know, like yourself. So I've read Red Sun and things like that. Mm. Red Sun's an interesting take because it's one of the many, many Elseworld Supermans that is a, a sort of bastardization of the character, an idea of the character if he was something else. Yeah. And this is something we talked about in our... Is it the boys episode when we talked about Homelander? Probably. Is this idea of an evil Superman. Yes. And it's an idea that may have been interesting at one point, but is now done to death, quite frankly. It is in every single Elseworlds tale. You know, you've seen Invincible. Irredeemable is another comic book that's done the same thing. Injustice, the video game, and then yes. based on comic books, have all done this storyline. And it is, in my opinion, quite tired because it is very antithetical to what Superman is. And like you say, he is peace, justice, and the American way, yeah. uh, or that really should be the American ideal, you know, rather than... <laughs> yeah. um... Well, a lot has changed since uh, 39. <laughs> yeah, but or maybe <laughs> not as much as we like. Interestingly, though, there has been a lot of discourse online recently about Superman. There was a lot of... I don't know if you've seen any of this, but there was a lot of rumours saying that he was going to appear... Henry Cavill was going to appear with the DC junket at Comic-Con. Yes. And then he didn't. And then someone dragged up an old article where basically... It's an interview, I think Warner Brothers said, saying that they don't really know what to do with Superman and how to handle him in the 21st century. Mm. And so there's been quite a lot of talk about it online in comic book circles. And it's really annoying because we are looking like we jumped on a bandwagon now, <laughs> which we didn't. We've had this episode planned since like year dot. You know, we said our oh, 50th one's got to be a big character. Let's do Superman. So do you think he works as uh, Superman as a character? Do you think he works for the 21st century? I mean, that is a really good question because... We are definitely oversaturated with comics and comic book heroes and superheroes and all this sort of stuff. Mm. Where he is the he's the ultimate. He is the invincible, flying, can't die, can't get hurt, with exceptions. Yeah. So I think you need someone that has a weakness that is relatable. Right. With Superman, it's like, oh, kryptonite. So that's it. That's going to be your one thing is kryptonite. Oh, and he can't see through lead. There you go. That'll do. And since he's been around a lot more superheroes have come out of comic books and tv shows and everything where they seem more human and they're more relatable yeah if superman came out like now like the last few years whatever i don't think it would be as much of a success as he would have as he has been because he's you know he was the first hero and going back to the old tv shows like i'm talking like the old old ones and the comics you know seeing this person who, who could fly they were like oh my god that's amazing you know he can fly up the side of a skyscraper or catch things in the air yeah where now you're like, well, that's pretty much any superhero can do that <laughs> with an extent. So I don't think it would work necessarily if he was brand new now. Mm. I think it's just that he is a, such a classic hero that that's why everyone does. I wouldn't say that everyone loves him, but everyone knows who he is. Yeah. But I think it, they would be a really hard job to get him to work in 21st century mm. with the powers and the skill sets that he's got, if that makes sense. It does. I mean, you said something interesting there about whether or not he's relatable and i think that's one of the big discourses around this is, is this idea is, is superman relatable you know he's invincible etc i think that's partly the mistake a lot of modern filmmakers and writers are making with him is that he doesn't have to be the flawed hero you know we've got enough of those yeah. we've got hundreds how many aspirational superheroes do we have and i think that's the real thing is that superman shouldn't be relatable he should be aspirational we should want to be better and we should be inspired by the actions of this character mm -hmm. it shouldn't be that every superhero has has to be flawed or brooding and have errors in their ways a good writer can come up with drama for a character that is strong and smart and fast and all of these things they've got good powers but the drama can come from elsewhere but the character himself i think the reason he's been as successful as he has and the reason he's still about is that he is an aspirational superhero he is more akin to captain america than he is to batman yes you know you want to do better i think captain america gets a pass because he's not as powerful and i think that's why a lot of people can relate to that and there's also the fact that he is um an ex-soldier which obviously uh plays into a certain demographic within america but and he's human and he's human and all of this yeah exactly but i think you sell superman you don't sell him as a relatable character necessarily necessarily you sell him as an aspirational one yeah it's that old sort of saying of girls want to be with him but guys want to be him kind of thing we all want to be a superhero i get or you know comic book fans kind of want to be 
And of course, you'd want to fly. You want to you want to be impervious to all sorts. So he's the one to aim for. I mean, yeah. To a degree, I wasn't necessarily talking about the powers. I meant more the personality and the drive. I mean, I mean more that the fact that I mean, I think this is perhaps why he doesn't resonate in in modern films as much is because you know we might talk about this later. Is they're trying to make him relatable to all political parties and all spectrums whereas superman is a very progressive character from year dot he's a very i mean he's woke superman is <laughs> as always has been oh woke. god here we go he is a very very progressive character and I, they've been sort of shying away from that lately and you'll see this with superman versus man of steel is that they're sort of reversing on that whereas you know they should just lean heavily into that mm. he is a very progressive character and we should aspire to be like him in his accepting nature in his good grace races in the way he deals with things and i think sometimes from a personality standpoint they're trying to make it more like well we have to give him some flaws some relatability well no we don't have to do that we can make him something that we can all aspire to something we can look at superman and go i can't have the powers i can't do all of that but i can be more like that in my real life yeah I'm generally a good person and i quite like that i like the idea that this is a superhero who is basically the best person you know yeah what a fucking guy i love this guy what a great guy i wish i was him and that is how they should sell superman in my opinion yeah he's he is and he should always be wholesome and he's Mm. strong as in not just the powers but he's got a strong personality the fact that powers or not i would expect him to jump in and save someone or stand up for someone's rights or whatever exactly yeah completely agree and i think that's a good point to move on to the films for today. Mm-hmm. So we're covering two films, 1978 Superman and Man of Steel from 2013. Yes. Let's start with the older of the two. So Superman the movie, as it's called. Yes, Superman the movie. I honestly can't remember the last time that I watched this film. No. It's one of the all-time classics. It's charmingly pleasant. Um, there is no alliteration <laughs> this week, unfortunately. I do apologise, my brain has not been working. No, um, you could have just used the word super. It's It's super. Man. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, I, I love it. It's such a good film. And as I said, I've not watched it in years. And I didn't get bored. I enjoyed it from start to end. I enjoyed it. And it's a very traditional way of telling a story. It's all in one line. It's a linear way of storytelling. Yeah. Which we'll come on to the Man of Steel bit in a bit. <laughs> but um, to me, it's, it's fun to see where he comes from. Fun to see him become a man and then become super, effectively. Mm -hmm. No pun intended, but I think it's just, it's nice to see him and his upbringings of the era, like, you know, 78, almost in the 80s sort of thing. Comics have been around for a long time at this point, but this was, I believe, the first comic book film, effectively. It's definitely the one that sort of hit the mainstream, I guess. It may be. I don't know if Flash Gordon had comic books and things like that, but yeah, yeah, I mean, certainly one of the the big superhero films, yeah. Yeah, it's the one that grabbed everyone's attention and Mm. thought, okay, so uh, this is going to be a thing. (laughs) So (laughs) jump what we now 40 years 60 years that long i can't do maths that quickly <laughs> and now every other film that comes out every month is about a superhero yeah and we wouldn't have had that if it wasn't for this film in mm. my opinion no yeah i think you're right i think i like many people of our age group saw this film at a young age mm-hmm. i think it's possibly one of my first interactions with superheroes in general uh, and i imagine that's the case for a lot of people going to the cinema in 1978 like you say yeah. it wasn't a, a mainstay thing at the time it wasn't common but then obviously there were radio plays there were tv serials batman tv series was very big mm-hmm. that had, had a film actually hadn't it by this point that had, had a batman the movie using the same cast as the tv show oh right sorry the, yeah the one from the 60s not the 89 yeah, yeah. exactly no, so, so there's a couple of exceptions but yeah i mean this there is something magical about this you know this was promoted as you'll believe a man can fly yes uh, you know that was the tagline for it and as a kid absolutely yes i did i think the bits where he's racing trains where he's learning his powers you know they stick in my mind they yeah. were you know as part of superman's origin as anything i've read in the comic books so whether it happened or not in the comic books i was like yep no that definitely happened mm-hmm. you know and this is a film that came out 40 years after superman's creation and 44 years from today like you say yeah something like that i don't know yeah sure (laughs) i had a like you i had an absolute blast with it i loved it i mean it's by no means a perfect film oh no it definitely has its flaws i think the fact that it takes about 20 minutes to get to earth is a bit of an error it sort of slows the beginning bit down i think lois's weird spoken word mind poetry that she does when they're flying very odd (laughs) and i think there's a bit of a cop-out ending of course oh yeah i don't mind a cop-out ending so much in an aspirational superhero film like this to be fair i did forget that this was the one 
on that he turns time back. Yeah. And he does that by turning the Earth round the other way, which... It's not how I mean, it works. That's how, that's how it works, right? Yeah, I mean, that would destroy the Earth. Yeah. I'm going to say that that was artistic license and that was just them, sh <laughs> them showing a visual representation of Superman travelling in time. I think literally saying he turned the Earth back on his axis is... um. Yeah, I think that's some physics issues involved there. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's about a man who can fly, so well, yeah. I mean, I think that goes out <laughs> of the window completely. That's fair. But yeah, I, you know, I don't want to do a classic character breakdown because we've got a lot to cover. Yeah. But um, I think this version of Clark Kent as a whole, I mean, he's just swell, isn't he? He's great. They even say that in the film that he's just a swell guy, mm -hmm. and not a lot of people use that word swell in the seventies, apparently. <laughs> but it's it's a great word, and it does sum up who Clark is. Yeah. And then like he sort of flipped to Superman, you know, he fights for truth and the. American American way and all sort of stuff. Yeah. He doesn't actually show up to halfway through the film. No. But this film is very, very focused on Superman, which, as you would expect, is a Superman film. So he is the main character. Hmm. So there's not a lot of like subplots about any others. A little bit in there of with Lex and with Lois, but it always sticks with him. He's the main character. He is the antagonist. No. Protagonist. Definitely the protagonist. Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> I forgot the <laughs> terms. I think you've been confused by this film. I don't know. Are you supporting Lex? Yeah. I, I like a guy who can pull off several wigs. <laughs> I mean, uh, you're right. I mean, Lex's bit is basically a little comedy interlude from time to time. Yeah. And then he has a bit of a plot at the end. And it is sort of played like that tv serial what's superman up to this week and then there's just a bit of a payoff at the end mm. but i love this portrayal you're right i i think christopher reeve does an excellent job he is honest and earnest and funny i think there's that really great moment about midway through the film where he's doing the interview with lois and he switches between superman it's after they've been flying yeah he switches between superman and clark kent mm -hmm. and you can see the physical changes the raising of octave of his voice yes you know his voice becomes more nasal and whiny as he becomes clark kent he slouches in his clothes and yeah i mean absolutely i can fully believe people wouldn't see that they are one and the same person yeah i was having the exact same conversation with kate it isn't just glasses you know people say oh he's just wearing glasses no he's not he's changing his entire bodily demeanor and you actually notice that the vast majority of the time in this film no one looks at clark no no one cares for him he keeps saying things to them and no one pays him any attention they shut lifts on him they shut doors on him yep. and this is the idea he is not just putting on some glasses and just walking around as himself he is making himself invisible yes that's taken from a comic which obviously we will come on to yeah but yeah i also forgot how humorous the film is like i said a lot of it comes from lex and otis they get a little bit of a sort of slapstick thing happening there yeah but then also like superman as a character is quite funny mm -hmm. you know he's there's a bunch of one liners in this i'm not going to go for all of them because there's too many but oh well, yeah i would hope you won't we're not just here to recite the film <laughs> Uh, you know, things like, oh, I don't drink and fly. Mm. A, that's funny. And B, it's responsible of him not to do that. <laughs> and then also there's the bit where he gets hit by like a lead pipe or something. Maybe not lead because it's probably hurt him. I don't know. I think it's a crowbar, isn't it? Crowbar. And he's like, oh, bad vibrations. And the guy's like, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. And it's yeah. like, it's humorous, but it's it's healthy humor. It's yeah. not dark comedy that we're used to with these this era. Yeah. It's all healthy, family, wholesome humor. It actually reminds me a bit of modern Marvel. You know, it's corny humor. But I think even the character and at the time they knew it was corny humour and that's very yes. much in keeping with the character. There's something as I said about it, it's sort of like the old TV serials where he just delivers these little one-liners and he's just charming with it mm. and it doesn't ever feel like he's mocking the people he's arresting he is a little bit yeah, but, but the fact he does it with a smile and good grace and makes him feel a little bit stupid for trying. Yeah, almost like a little wink to the camera but not quite mm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do find it quite sad almost that if someone said to me, who is Superman? I don't mean Clark Kent. Mm. I would say it is Christopher Reeves. Mm. To me, that's the iconic Superman. Yeah. But then the last five, ten years, people go, oh, it's Henry Cavill or however you say his name. I think that was but right. No, it's, it, 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 to me, it's, what was it, Cavill? Or uh, Cavill? Same, I don't know. Same difference. Yeah. You know, to me, it will always be Christopher Reeves because he's that epitome of Superman. Mm. And I don't quite get the appeal for Henry. Well, we'll go on to this when we go on to Man of Steel. Yeah. I mean, I get that there is an appearance of Henry Cavill and he is, or Cavill, and he is a, uh, you know, he's a good looking man. He's a charming person in real life, but through the films, we'll talk about it in a moment, but you just don't get any of that. Yeah. And I think what the Man of Steel is missing that this film has, to bring it back to this film, yep. is Clark Kent. Yes. And I think that is the most important thing is that there has to be the duality of the character. You know, it's not this idea, you know, Batman is a slightly flawed argument. There's always an 
argument that Bruce Wayne is the mask and Batman's the real person. I'm I don't entirely buy into that. I think they need each other, Batman and Bruce Wayne, to actually have a functioning life. Mm-hmm. I think that was kind of the point of the Batman. But anyway, back to this film. <laughs> it's not the case that Superman is uh it's not the point that Superman is the hero and Clark Kent is just some other guy. Clark Kent is as important to the idea of Superman as Superman himself. Yes. yes. Clark Kent is the character that was raised on Earth mm-hmm. by Ma and Pa Kent. Yep. He is the character that falls in love with Lois and has all these family connections. And that's where a lot of the drama and a lot of the story can come from with a really really powerful character like this and then superman is how you show him being his best self exactly yeah Yeah. i mean i do like the fact that he's been raised by such a nice old couple Hmm. the fact that it's not just some hick family in the middle of nowhere like i think that's where the idea of the red sun came from i'm assuming you know what if he got raised by someone else or a different country or whatever yeah but in this you've got Ma and Park Kent. They're charming, they're pleasant, they're just that old couple on a farm who couldn't have kids and now they've got a kid. Yeah. Fine, that's great. And I that sounds weird, but I like the way that Jonathan Kent dies in this film. Yeah. Uh, the fact that he has a heart attack. There wasn't anything Superman could do for him. Yes, he suppose he could have flown him to the hospital, but you still can't stop a heart attack. The fact that we did have a little sort of tip of the hat to it when the car breaks down or there's a wheel gets busted up or something, and um, Mark Kent's like, careful of your heart, because the doctor told you about your heart and whatever, and then later on the film, heart attack. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think that's such a wholesome and human way to lose someone. Mm. That happens when he's quite young. So then he brings that forward into his adult life, which again just cements his human emotions into being Superman and Clark. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it is the idea that he cannot save everyone no matter how much he tries, and it inspires him to try. Yeah. It also inspires him to make the decision he makes at the end of the film with turning back time. He really doesn't want to lose another person from his life. He can save this one person. He shouldn't, but he does it anyway. We'll talk about Man of Steel later, and I think this very much will come up as the difference between these two storytelling techniques is the Mm -hmm. idea that this serves a very human purpose, a very real purpose. Jonathan Clark's death is because Superman can't save everyone and sometimes people just die of heart attacks when they're elderly. Yeah. There is another story going on in the other film we're talking about today. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, to change it over then to his Krypton father, mm. Jor-El, Marlo Brando. Uh, Mar- Marlon. Mar- whatever his name is. That guy. Marlo. Um, I mean, he... Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't like him in this. <laughs> <laughs> I think because I've heard stories about him not being the greatest actor to work with mm. and the fact that he got paid stupid amounts of money for being in it for 20 minutes. Yeah. And he got 11% of the cut of the, what do you call it, like the, the studio intake. The box office. Yeah, that, that, yeah, he got 11% of that, which at that time was huge. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, we were talking about Christopher Reeves earlier on. I think he's like fourth, maybe fifth on the billing. But yeah, so it, like, I think because I've heard such bad things about him and the little story, it's not an Easter egg, it's just something that I, I did find out afterwards, is that he didn't learn his lines. He didn't care about his lines. There's all these rumours about what he wanted the character to be like and whatever. But apparently there was a scene right at the start when they're putting the baby in the little spaceship crib thing. He didn't know his lines. So they wrote the lines on the nappy of the baby. Yeah. So he was just holding, holding the child and put him down in the crib and he just read his lines and I'm thinking like you just sound like an absolute arsehole <laughs> and then it really makes his portrayal like just to me very like just blank like a uh, I'm, I'm your father bye I still quite like his portrayal here. Marlon Brando is, you know, was widely known as the greatest actor of his generation. And as such, he commanded a huge pay packet for films like this, where he was not particularly interested in the story. It's kind of like Alec Guinness did with Star Wars. He got paid a huge amount of money for that because he got a percentage of the box office as well. And Marlon Brando is well known for taking these shortcuts. Uh, the, the, uh, the Island of Dr. Moreau is another film where he could not be bothered, turned up late. I mean, there was mitigating circumstances around that i believe he had um uh, lost a daughter around the same time so he turned up and basically refused to learn any of his lines for that and had an earpiece in and his assistant would just read all the lines down the earphone (laughs) and he would repeat them and he just turns up changes everything but he was the level of celebrity at the time that he could do this he could just turn up and say no i'm not doing that if you want me in your film you will change the film to fit me Mm. and in this he's doing a you know, he's doing an English accent for some reason. But, <laughs> yeah. Okay, whatever. Yeah. But, I mean, generally speaking, I think he, he works for this role. I think some of those lines that he delivers later on when he comes back and gives the, the talk to Clark, I think it's really good. Yeah. 
I think they have become iconic, which is good. It's just re-watching it, it's just like, oh, now that I know about this sort of stuff about you, <laughs> it's really just dampened my view of you on screen. It's fair. I think they also filmed bits for the second one at the same time, or the audio or whatever, so he didn't come back for the second one, Yeah. even though he was in the second one, but whatever. But yeah, this film makes me want to go and watch the rest of them. I've got a box set. Mm. of the original four films and superman returns which i probably won't go back to superman returns anytime soon i i would probably stop before the fourth one as well if i was <laughs> terrible what's the one where someone gets electrocuted and becomes like a electric i think that might be it like a that, nuclear that man no no it's a i think it's a female i don't i've not looked this up but there is a character it's not electro because that's marvel but second one is i've not watched these in ages second one is zod yep Third one is Lex Luthor again, but it's the red kryptonite, so Superman turns evil. Fourth one. It must be the fourth one, yeah. Because that's that's the image of it. Whenever I think about a Superman film, that's a bit that I think is just that person being zapped to death, pretty much. <laughs> and I was been very, very, you know, I was very young at the age of seeing that, and I thought that's quite horrific. Like <laughs> this person just being zapped to death, and then she does yeah. come back as like electric power person. Gee, I do not remember that. There is a character. I can't be bothered to look up the name. I remember it being, a, it had a very strong anti-nuclear weapons, the fourth one, but I can't remember anything about it. It's the one I've watched the least. I think I've watched it once and it is absolutely awful. Yeah, Christopher I, Reeve's still great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, so I think this is the thing. I ended up watching Man of Steel on Thursday and then this on Friday. Right. And in all honesty, I think... I mean, I don't know if my rating for this uh, would be as, as favourable as it is if I had watched it the other way around, right. you know? Oh, yeah. I think seeing what Superman became really made me appreciate what came before. Yeah, okay. Speaking of which, then, shall we move on to Man of Steel 2013? I suppose we have to, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's that tells me something. So yeah. what are your thoughts of this film? Well, we touched on uh, Henry Cavill, Superman... I don't see it, really. I don't get what the big hype is about him. Mm. I mean, I'm sure he's he seems to be quite a pleasant person, so that's good. Yeah. But the films that he's been in as Superman haven't been super to me. It's not like, oh my God, this is the iconic Superman. Oh my, like, fantastic. Yeah. It's just, oh, he can fly around. He can do stuff. Oh, great. Oh, and uh, oh, that happens. Oh, yeah, he does that. Oh, yeah, okay. I think it's the script and it's potentially Zack Schneider being Jack Schneider. Yes. So it's just like, oh, let's make it broody and dark. And yeah, let's give him a, a good or origin story. It's like, no, he's got the origin story. Yeah. Just update it a little bit for the 21st century, like we were saying at the start. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, I mean, I do like the fact that you get a lot more Krypton in this. There's a lot more backstory to Krypton as a planet. Yeah. I like that. Um, yep. So that's about what I like. <laughs> <laughs> No, there are bits. I absolutely agree with you here. I will say, I think the best Henry Cavill has ever been as Superman is in the Joss Whedon cut of the Justice League. Wow. Now, that, that film is an absolute clusterfuck. It's awful. <laughs> but the moment where Superman steps forwards and is saying, like, um, you know, I'm a big fan of truth, but I also like justice. And he does that cheesy line at the end. I'm thinking, mm. yeah, that if Henry Cavill could do that the whole time, I would believe that was Superman. Yes. And then Zack Snyder as Justice League comes out and they cut that whole bit and instead he just lasers someone in the face and kills them which is much yeah it's quite a different take on the character obviously we have been down on Zack Snyder in the past we have talked about this several times in the podcast that we don't really gel with his work his views <laughs> I guess so, his yeah. views his yeah exactly his his take on characters I think yeah. is my main issue with him but casting my mind all the way back to 2013 mm -hmm. I was genuinely excited for this film you know I watched the trailer I analyzed it it had uh and this is the piss take it had lines in the trailer and in the film from one of my absolute favorite comics all-star superman by grant morrison mm -hmm. the line about they will crawl and they will fall and then they will follow you into the sun and that comic is a love letter to superman right. and it is such a like you know this is the perfect superman and it is quite frankly a piss take that they used <laughs> in this film because it is right, the complete yeah. opposite of the character we get here now this was coming off the back of the dark knight trilogy mm -hmm. it was produced by christopher nolan it was yes. written by jonathan nolan I only learned that, the Christopher bit, yesterday. Well, if I did know that, I forgot it. And you can really see it. You're like, right, mm. okay, I see what they're going for here. The Dark Knight, like, grittiness of superheroes. Exactly. Now, I thought, in my head at the time, I was thinking, wow, they're going to do for Superman what they've done for Batman. Yeah, okay. And in a way, they did. 
but learning all the wrong lessons from Batman Begins, you know, <laughs> I think it just doesn't fit the tone, you know, because Superman is a very different character to Batman. Yes. You know, the Hans Zimmer music in this is fine. You know, I don't understand why the Kryptonians like dubsteps quite so much. <laughs> all of their music is... Um, but I just... The problem is, is that, as I say, Superman is not Batman. You know, Superman is optimistic and aspirational. He's not a miserable, sad sack brooding mm. about his dead parents all the time and then only becomes Superman in the last five minutes. There's a bit halfway through the film where he gets his outfit. Yeah. And I'm thinking, all right, here we go. Right, I think it's the end of the first act. Great, he's got his outfit. Let's do it. Next scene, just not in his outfit. Yeah. And then for, for the next hour, he just doesn't wear it. It's like, oh, what's the fucking point of that? <laughs> yeah, it's just a bit like, I mean, I get what they were going for. And I get the, just before I go into that, like I was saying about how the original is, he's born, sent to earth, he's a kid, grows up. It's A to B to C to whatever. This is... You got a bit of Krypton, then you got a flash forward, mm -hmm. then you got a flashback. It's hopping around, which I'm yep. not saying that I'm not a fan of that. That's fine because that is very that's a new take compared to the the old one, which is fine. Well, what it is is it's Batman Begins. It's exactly yeah. what they did in Batman Begins, except it doesn't work here, mm. you know, because it it is completely unnecessary. It, it's you know, it just is doing what Batman Begins did, but with no point. Yeah. It, it doesn't just there. help the structure of the story. Yeah, and I do. I said I I do get what they were going for the fact that. You've got him, he's grown up as a human. He's mm. not quite got the Clark Kent persona just yet. So he's out going across the world, saving people from oil rigs. And it's the bit towards the start where the oil rig collapses. Mm. And he's really struggling to hold it up. I'm like, you're Superman. <laughs> what? Why? Just, I mean, it can't be that heavy. Well, it probably is, but yeah. he, to him it's not. And I'm there going, just stop it and then you've got this, or the same kind of scene with Aquaman in, in his film where he's struggling to pick up a submarine or whatever it is they're making all the heroes the same yeah they're, they're trying to show that they're not powerful enough to do something but it's fucking Superman <laughs> he's, yeah. he's the most powerful out of everyone mm -hmm. Just pack it in and stay in line. Like it just annoys me. It yeah, really doesn't. I know what me. you mean. They they are toning down the powers because that's the only way they can think to make them relatable. They think, well, these no one's going to relate to characters with lots of powers. Well, you would if you gave them a personality. That's the difference. <laughs> if you give these characters a personality, then people will relate to them. It doesn't matter how strong they are. Mm. You know, I, I think this is this is it. You know, there is no Clark Kent in this film. He doesn't really appear until you the know, last two minutes. <laughs> yeah, he walks in with glasses and goes, "I'm Clark Kent," and it's like everyone should just look at him and go no you're superman wearing some glasses yeah he because he doesn't change his performance exactly I mean, he is just superman is just this gruff moody brooding man who snaps people's necks and picks fist fights with batman i just it is not a version of superman i recognize it. yeah i i mean this has been touched on over the years countless times but i don't like how superman kills zod mm -hmm. i get that it's meant to show that he didn't have any other choice um, that it was, you know, Zod or this family that he didn't know, but, you know, he cares for humans and whatever. But just not at all in, in any of the film does he care for humans. No. Apart from that scene. You know, they're smashing through buildings, everything's going to shit. Oh, no, don't don't kill this family of four. Yeah. But you've just collapsed about 600 houses and buildings and you've, been, you've exactly. annihilated. You've destroyed half Metropolis. There's a bit where, like, a, a fuel truck is, like, thrown at him. And instead of stopping it, he just hops over it and it just blows up behind him and blows up a building it's like superman. <laughs> yeah. any version of comic superman worth itself would have stopped that truck and just put it down on the floor yeah, caught it or yeah and stopped it blowing it up a building or... behind him yeah. but he just goes whoop yeah or if it was to blow up he could have like breathed in all the all the oxygen around it and then extinguished the flames exactly Done. very very classic very very superman little touches like that would have shown him saving people as well as fighting all this does is for 45 minutes at the end of the film which is entirely too long 45 minutes of him well him cgi him <laughs> punching someone else into a building over and over and over again killing countless people mm. i mean it is just there is if there was just little moments where it showed all right he's gonna try and put out a fire or he's gonna try and direct it away from yeah there's a bit where they fly off into space i'm like oh great superman you've taken them out of the city good work yeah. now all you got to do is land in a cornfield somewhere no nope, land right back in the middle of the city <laughs> in the same spot <laughs> <laughs> All it would have taken is these little moments of humanity, these little moments to show, oh, actually, this is a fight that he hasn't chosen, but he is trying to help people. Mm. But they just don't bother. And that's because Zack Snyder does not understand these characters. And yeah. we've said this before. He just doesn't get them. He just goes, oh, well, my worldview is that, you know, Superman's unrealistic and he should be more, like, nihilistic and out for himself. So that's what I'm going to do. Well, that's not who the character is. Oh, stop it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this film is about... 
I don't know, five, ten minutes longer than the original. You know, there's not a great change there. No. But it just feels so much longer. <laughs> it does. I was sat there about halfway through just hoping it to finish. Mm -hmm. I even, like, it's quite rare that I tend to leave the room to go get a drink or whatever. But I left the room to go to the toilet and came back. Normally I pause it and I thought, they're fighting. There's no point. Mm -hmm. I went off, came back. Oh, they're still fighting. Okay. They could have cut the Smallville fight, maybe. Yeah. And then just gone straight into the terraforming and whatever because the terraforming i thought that's quite a nice touch and that's quite yeah. a nice idea it shows him willing to sacrifice himself yeah. and has a little bit of that superman it but like you say from this moment the smallville fight starts it's almost all action from there on out and it's about 45 minutes and it's yeah. entirely too long and yeah it's, it's just boring uh, uh, i can't think of a cool moment in that that's the thing though it's a 45 minute fight scene where i go all i can remember is the bit where he hops over a fuel tank and lets it blow up behind him mm. and then snaps the villain's neck it, it just blows my mind that this was someone's idea of this is how we reboot superman yeah I, I think we should probably i mean it may stem from the changes to his parentage and we should probably talk about this yeah i mean mark and fine in my opinion i mean i'm not gonna say a name because i think everyone knows what, <laughs> what his mum's called at this point yeah. i mean I, I'll, I'll just have to ask bruce wayne you know I'm, I'm sure he knows yeah yeah jonathan kent i don't like him no hands down don't like him no um, thank you he's not very supportive <laughs> and i mean kate slightly disagrees with me i think i'm just i'm very against this film so any small bit that i don't like i'm like hate it hate it turn it off hate it but you know after the bit where the bus crashes into the water mm -hmm. and clark says something like oh well what was i supposed to do not save them and they could die or whatever and he's like yeah maybe yeah no you don't say that you go i understand it was a bit of a tough situation you're what 12 14 i don't know how old he was maybe hide your face next time <laughs> do it more carefully but that you know. is exactly what happens in every other version of superman it happens in the book it happens in the original superman the movie you know the wholesome mar and pa kent who raised an alien to become the best of us with a good old traditional values and except in this film the good old tradition values are not using your abilities to help anyone and potentially letting children die on a bus and then also don't help me as i go and kill myself in a tornado for some reason yeah, i mean because, it's because of a fucking dog <laughs> it's just absolutely no don't don't say it's like a martyr it was like he's just bored of the conversation and just thought i'm gonna go kill myself <laughs> you know he is like you said in 78 superman the point of the death is to highlight that despite clark's powers he can't save everyone exactly in this film the point of his death is you shouldn't save anyone hide who you are and don't try and help people yeah. your secret identity is more important than saving people clark no that is not what you should be being taught yeah. and it is so over the top and it is pointlessly well it is pointless yep. it is easily avoidable death yep. and the entire point of it is to replicate the original film while also adding a load of spectacle to it for no apparent reason completely missing the point hurricane why not yeah exactly yeah sure all right yeah, let's just have some cgi wind great <laughs> as we saw with watchmen mm. it is the idea that yes okay a similar thing is happening and you know the visuals are roughly the same but you've completely missed the point yes the story behind it the reasoning for this happening it isn't there yeah it's a stupid way of dying and it's a stupid way to prove a point as well i mean they could have gone several ways like first of all he stops clark from going to get the dog anyway mm. he's like no no i'll go get him you take care of whoever yeah. i mean stupid because Clark could just go and save the dog and then just go hide somewhere and say that, oh, I escaped very easily or whatever, or, oh, I was lucky. Well, this is the point. Like, no one is paying attention to Clark. Exactly. During, I mean, it's a hurricane or a tornado. People aren't looking at him. Yeah, and then he literally stood there very, very close to it, but he's got time to stop, look at Clark, how God knows how far away, <laughs> look him straight in the eyes and go, no, son, don't save me. It's dead. It's terrible. No. And it makes Superman the character who stood and watched his dad die when he could have helped. Yeah. Why have you done that? And because his dad told him to. I mean, the, the cast, I don't think, is the problem. Kevin no. Costner is fine in this role. I think, you know, Lois Lane is fine. She, I mean, there's no version in, of Lois Lane in my head that says tinkle. <laughs> she would be more likely to say, like, well, what happens if I need to take a piss? Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, I noticed that she is a strong contender. This film is a strong contender for our Abs Position Award this year. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There is both the Jor-El PowerPoint and <laughs> yep. also there's a line where Lois Lane is like, the one of her first lines when she comes to meet Perry White is like, I'm a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. It's like, yeah, who are you telling that? Like, surely your boss knows that. Thanks <laughs> yeah. for explaining that to the audience, Lois. You worked there enough years that I'm sure he knows that. You probably worked there when you got that prize. Yeah. 
she's all right in this. I think she's a lot more ballsy, a lot more worldly wise, less of a damsel in distress as the 70s version. I don't think so. I think she's a lot less spunky. I think she's very... She doesn't get herself into distress as much. Like you say, she still does. But she also just doesn't do as much. She doesn't seem to have as much um, drive of her own. She doesn't seem to be as forceful. She seems quite, almost a little bit meek. I disagree on that one, but can't be asked to argue because... This film annoys me. She also seems kind of stupid. I mean, going into that cliff and that cave on her own without telling anyone was pretty stupid. Yeah, I suppose but, so. Um, also, I mean, while we're on the subject of characters acting out of character, isn't there a line where Perry White on the phone, to, when she publishes the article about Superman, and Perry White on the phone says, like, this is not the time for journalistic integrity, tell them who your source was, or something like that. And I'm like, the one thing, the one thing about Perry White through all iterations is he is the best journalist like he is the journalist yeah. he is the journalist he is the most integrity in terms of all journalists he is the kind of journalist you want in the real world to this film doesn't do really anything with him and then basically says you should reveal your sources which no one ever does <laughs> or should if they're a journalist <laughs> exactly as i say the one thing about that character is he is a really good journalist and they didn't do that with the character instead they made him i don't know good at trying to dig not jimmy olsen out of a hole <laughs> yeah why was Jimmy in this? And then he well, appears in bloody Batman for Superman and he dies in the first 10 minutes. Spoiler, I don't care if that ruined yeah. it for you. It's not the worst thing that happens in that film. <laughs> well, the, the discussion here actually is that the character of Jenny was meant to be Jenny Olsen, a gender-flipped version of the character. Right. They then wrote that out. They got rid of that idea. Or they just never actually revealed the surname. They just said Jenny. Yeah. But... There was this idea that that character who got trapped was essentially the version of Jimmy Olsen for this film. Oh, that fixes the entire film. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, five stars. <laughs> I don't think this film is well I was gonna say I don't think it's terrible I do think it's terrible I don't think it's completely without merit but also the main problem I have with it is the actions of the characters not feeling like the characters yeah. and that is such a big problem that I can't get beyond that it ruins my entire enjoyment of the film I cannot watch this film without thinking I don't like any of these people I don't want to spend any time with any of these people which is the complete opposite of the original yeah. 1978 film but speaking of original, shall we go all the way back to 1938? It would be a shame not to. So we're going to talk about Action Comics number one and Superman mm. number one. Now, these are comics from 1938, characters created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster. Obviously, they're pretty slim tones. This shouldn't take too long. But what did you think of these two comics? Well, yeah, so we'll start at the start. You yeah. know, best place to start. Makes sense. I felt like I was reading Action Comics number one in my head in like an old timey voice, you know, like the old the old timey <laughs> radio voice. Yeah. I don't know why, but at least the first couple of pages, I was like, I need to stop talking in that in in my head in that way <laughs> oh no I know what you mean there's the little panels where it says where what's going on it's like meanwhile yeah, it is like, right, across Metropolis <laughs> yeah I know what you mean oh here he comes and wh whatever <laughs> but it definitely feels like an old comic and a comic of its time mm. anyway it's probably not the original comic there's probably other comics that came before it but to me it is right this is the start of superheroes and it's actually his origins. I do like the lines that are used in it, such as fight you weak livered polecat, <laughs> which I just find those old sort of phrases quite amusing. And I do like the use of hoodlum. Mm -hmm. That's a, a nice word. But yeah, for a 17 page comic, or at least the, the yeah, episode, Superman bit, yeah. Which I, I suppose you didn't read the rest. I didn't go on to the Western story, no. <laughs> but you love it. <laughs> you love a good old Western. Anyway, it races through Clark's upbringing, like two panels, and he's Superman, pretty much. This version of Superman, very, very forceful. He's very, you're not going to help me, therefore I'm going to grab you by the ankles and hang you upside down <laughs> outside. Yeah. Or just scare them to death. Yeah, sort of thing. he just like, gets oh, on with things, okay. doesn't he? He's like, <laughs> yes. I'm powerful, I'm going to do what I want. Which, yeah, I mean, I'm glad that got changed. <laughs> but maybe <laughs> Zack Schneider read that one panel and thought, ah, that's what I need, a very forceful, dark <laughs> Superman. I've got it. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, he's not He's not that dark, I would say. He's no, still... not dark, yeah. He is still truth and justice and all that crap. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. But yeah, your views of this, I assume you've read this before, just because who no. you are? <laughs> well, no, actually, interestingly enough, I hadn't read this before. Oh, well. Although I feel like I had, because I have seen, particularly Action Comics number one, I've seen most of the panels in one form or another. Yeah. Like you say, it's only 17 pages long or something like that. So I had seen most of the content, but no, this is the first time I've actually sat down and read it from beginning to end. I mean, first page, <laughs> they really packed the story in. It is a yeah. really truncated event. It's like, his world blew up. He ended up on Earth. He was raised by Mara 
Grandpa Kent, and now he's Superman. Uh, whoa, I, I just blinked and I missed that. <laughs> and um, all of the stuff that goes into the film is, you know, you've got the things jumping and flying, racing trains. I think all of that's there. It's good. It's really actually amazing how much of the character, like you say, there's been some changes tonally in him being quite as wholesome and things like that. But from page one, you know, his powers, he doesn't fly, but he's got the powers. Mm-hmm. He is described as the champion of the oppressed, the physical marvel who had sworn to devote his existence to those in need, which pretty much sets out his character for the next 90 years. Yeah. You know, that is bam. From day dot, here's the character. There's been cosmetic changes. There have been changes to his powers. He went from being able to jump quite far to being able to leap whole buildings to being able to fly. Yeah, which I find it very, very odd that it keeps saying in this and in the Superman issue number one that he can leap one eighth of a mile yeah very very odd amount of distance <laughs> it's very very specific <laughs> it's quite specific isn't it yeah it's quite a long way but yeah i'm not saying it's not but it's just a bit <laughs> you would think that's quite a long way if someone if i saw someone leaping one eighth of a mile i'd probably be impressed yeah i mean i would, would as well but it's not like it's a super feat like but yeah later on he got flying i mean there's also little changes the editor is called something different of his newspaper oh and the, it's the daily star as well yeah exactly yeah it's called daily star not daily planet but generally speaking in this and superman number 1 which there's a bit of overlap between the two yeah there is the basis of what became superman is here yeah. you know you kind of think from day 1 it is just okay well, these are your building blocks it's morphed a lot since then yeah i don't think we're going to read anything earlier than this to be honest no but the only thing that i can compare it to is spider-man yeah because we read the first appearance of Mm spider-man and again a lot of the building blocks of that character and that hero are straight there in the first couple of panels yeah same with this Mm mm-hmm it's amazing i think that is what these old characters i mean the decompression we get with modern superhero comics is perhaps the reason why a lot of modern superhero characters don't catch on not just the fact they've not been around for a long time but the idea is that we have these characters that have been around for 60 or 90 years in the case of superman and there is a very fundamental basis to them that there's like this is the character now you understand the character everyone can write basically and people write loads of crap you know spider-man has been all sorts of different people superman's been all sorts of different people but because the basis of the character is found in that really opening panel everyone knows that yes it doesn't matter that someone wrote like, years and years down the line wrote superman being a jerk to someone else you know <laughs> and superman there's a whole website about superman being a jerk to people and it is hilarious but <laughs> it's not what people think about the character and i think that's sometimes the problem with modern modern superhero characters is they're not quite as defined from the off i think because of decompression of superhero comics you get a lot less dialogue in a one issue yeah it takes something for a character to pick up and i think things like uh ms marvel mm-hmm. she really capture people's imaginations as a modern character and i think that is because she is very well defined from the off and i think that's what this comic does well even though a lot of the details changed the fundamentals are still there yeah we may as well touch on superman issue one Mm -hmm. it's pretty much a reprinted action comics one with a few more details yeah yeah um there's a lot of the backstory is more fleshed out rather than being like two panels it's like four Mm -hmm. so you've got a little bit more in there but it could have gone into it a bit more which it does in the man of steel comic yeah but I was talking about Superman being a bit of a jerk and uh, not dark, but just having it his way. In this, he scares someone enough to go and join the army. He also drugs people and takes their place. Uh, yeah. And also he puts people in danger. He traps them in the in the mine. Mm-hmm. How did he know that by taking away that pole or whatever, the whole thing wouldn't collapse, not just the entrance? <laughs> so he's got supervision. So, so he can see into the future. <laughs> but like, yeah, it's a bit... It was fun to read. You know, I'm not saying it wasn't, but it's, um, like we said, you've got the blocks of the character in there. Fine. Yeah. But as you start to read the sort of towards the end of the comic, it gets a little bit out of hand for me. It's a little bit, <laughs> a little bit, no, it's just, you kind of think, is this Superman re- really? Is it? <laughs> like, yeah. should this, someone tell him that to stop doing these things? <laughs> he is a bit brusque at times. He does just sort of barge his way in, push people around. But then, you know, in some cases, that's really good when he goes in and stops that woman beating his wife and just basically yeah. scares him into passing out. It's like, yes, good work, Superman. And then in other times where he's just a random, some people, uh, there's some political dealings and he decides to scare him to passing out in that case. It's like, uh, okay, well, it's Superman, calm down. Yeah, it's a bit old, isn't it? But again, it was the 30s, whatever it was. So um, <laughs> again, it's a comic of its time it, yeah it was written post-war so there's gonna be a lot of... it's 1938 1939 so this oh, is sorry yeah yeah uh, yeah post-world well, war one a war yeah <laughs> there you go uh so i guess 
you know, if someone was to have all these powers in that time or that sort of era, you would want them to be a bit more ballsy and a bit more like, <laughs> right, I'm in charge. I've got the powers. I'm a good guy. Let's do it my way. I, mean, I think that's kind of a little bit of wish fulfillment on the writer's behalf. It's why if this guy who was super powerful could just barge in and tell people what to do and stop people beating their wives and was doing this, this, this and this. Wouldn't that be great? And everyone goes, yeah, that'd be cool. I'm going to read more about this character. Yeah. They are fast-paced. They're yes. kind of basic. Yes. The art, and particularly the colours, are, are basic and blocky. But that is the technology they were dealing with at the time. Printing was not quite as advanced, and therefore what they're printed on is had to go relatively simple. And there are panels that people's hair just changes colour. Like he's, he's got black <laughs> hair on one, blonde on the other, and then black again. And black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'll just, I'll just skim past that. <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's an old comic. I'm not going to yeah. sit here and you know comment or to judge this the colorization of these characters because well also because these were meant to be things that were entirely disposable. They had no idea that this was going to become the cultural phenomenon. That it, became. Yeah. it was something that people would have picked up at 1938, read through, had a few chuckles with their breakfast, then tossed in the bin. And that is what yeah. most people like did a with newspaper. these things. Yeah. Exactly right. That is what most people did with these things, which is why there's so few copies now. It wasn't like it is today where there's this speculative market where people are like, oh, I have to bag and board and put it in a drawer and never look at it again. <laughs> yeah. You know, it is this idea that people would just read it, have a few yucks, throw it in the bin yep. or pass it. You know, I, I, there's a comic book writer, I can't remember who it is now, who said that whenever he buys a comic, he reads it and then he always just leaves it at a park. He says he always just leaves it at a park or on a park bench or somewhere like that where kids are going to find it. And that's his idea of what to do with comics when he's done with them he doesn't bag and board he just goes boom done moving on and that's so someone else can read and enjoy it yeah that's a nice little touch i think quite like that and that is kind of what would have happened with these and someone might have brought it in and passed it around their friends in the playground and they all would have got their peanut butter and jam hands all over it and uh, <laughs> people would have tapped into this character and yeah. i can kind of see why because it was new and fresh i think like you say if this was made later on but if this were made later on, I don't think you would have had the other superheroes. You had pulp adventure heroes at the time, characters who were adventurers or Western comics. But mm -hmm. this idea of the superhero, I think that is really tapped into people's imaginations. And it's why they became the sort of prevailing media. But we are going to jump forward now by 40 something years. I think no yes that is right yeah 47 <laughs> 47 i don't know why not good guess it'll be it's close enough <laughs> the man of steel so this is a comic book limited series six issues by john byrne and dick giordano so john byrne went on to write more superman but today we're specifically talking about this six issues this comic came out in the wake of crisis on infinite earths right. uh, a storyline in the comic books which was basically dc's way of rebooting their universe streamlining the whole thing bringing it back to basics and as such the character gets a fresh start and more defined origin stories rather than what we've seen before where it's sort of piecemealed in over time mm -hmm. how's this for serendipity we have covered some john byrne works before have we <laughs> we have and it, this is our 50th episode and it was all the way back in episode one with x-men days of future past john byrne was the artist for those comic oh, books so him well. and claremont came up with a story together oh well there you go 50 issues apart we've covered our second john byrne work it was like it was planned it wasn't but <laughs> it's, it's like it was let's, let's say it was <laughs> well I'm, I'm glad you uh i'm glad you told me that a, a nice little tidbit yeah so man of steel or sorry the man of steel by john byrne what were your thoughts so this is the era so when we talk about old style comics mm -hmm. 80s is the old style that i tend to think of so that is insane to me because that is very much modern era as far as I, especially late 80s like this is well i mean because of the comics that we've covered throughout the 50 odd things we've done 80s is the furthest that we've gone back you know we did the x-men we've done this we've done that so when we compare that to the new stuff right the last 10 15 years maybe a bit earlier it's very short sharp here's some words here's some fighting sort of done yeah this is the block text again going back to the era of here's a big old paragraph of what's happening you know i will tell you what what you can see on page i didn't think there was too much of that actually i mean funnily enough there, there definitely is some of it so i'm rusting yeah. the book now no that's um because right. the the dust jacket's just fallen off so not the dust jacket <laughs> it makes a lot of noise i'll put that down gently there is some of that but not a huge amount and i think that's partly because john byrne was an artist as well as a writer yeah i think he does allow it to breathe a little bit more there's definitely pages usually big splash pages where he decides to put a lot of writing on them yeah but actually a lot of the character story i felt flowed quite well in without the caption boxes mm. carol 
So I went into it with that kind of that brain thought, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> whatever <laughs> brain say. thought. That brain thought. Yeah. Yeah. I, I went into it thinking, oh, it's going to be that sort of eighty style comic block text, you know. As Superman jumps above a building, I can see he's doing that. So don't tell me. <laughs> but even after the first issue, I thought this is actually quite different to the old inverted commas style that I've read before. Yeah. And I did find it a lot easier to read than the '30s ones because it was more rateable. So I watched the first film, mm-hmm. then I read the old comics, then I watched Man of Steel, then I read this. So I did, I did it in a bit of a weird order. Yeah. So it was the last thing that I did before the podcast. But I actually enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I was going to. Oh. And I know that we or touched on what I know about the character at the start. You know, I expected to see Perry White, expected to see Lex and Lois, but I wasn't expecting to see Batman. Yeah. Nor was I expected to see Bizarro. Mm-hmm. I thought, oh, this is a nice little touch, like two issues just in the middle of this little run. Yeah. Which I think it works well. But again, it does jump. You know, the first issue comes out and then it's like six months later. Mm-hmm. And then it's a year later, and it's like a year and a half later. There was a lot of time gaps here where I feel that some comic book writer, artist, whoever, could come in and like fill the gaps yeah. in those years, which I think that's a nice little touch when you leave it open for other creators to add their own touch into it. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. Post-Crisis of Infinite Earths, this was the idea of this comic was as a reboot and to basically fill in the gaps. So it is episodic, it is six issues, and they are broad strokes of Superman's early days. Mm. So I think it says some where they cover the ages so the six issues cover the ages of superman between the ages of 18 and 28 so right. it's a 10 year period on these six issues on these six issues yeah and you can see that it's evidenced in the um fact that lex luther starts the first issue or when he first appears with hair mm-hmm. and by the end he is bald yeah and you can see his hair loss across the issues i quite liked that but yeah there is no real overarching plot line apart from superman becomes more like superman yes but this is designed to set the scene and make way for what superman is going to be coming after this you know what superman is going to be going forward after mm-hmm. the big reboot yes um but you know, i haven't read this before either and i wasn't sure what to expect going in i've read other reboots they have done later ones in the new 52 and things like that mm-hmm. but i found burn superman I actually did it in complete opposite order to you i read this first i found burn superman to be hugely enjoyable yes the character especially clark and superman they are characters that I enjoyed spending time with. Lois was fun and assertive and aggressive at times. Mm-hmm. Lex was believable as this sort of human who could go toe to toe with the world's strongest because he is hiding behind law and order, but he is doing it in a political and underhanded or a business like way. In a, a very corrupt way. A very believable corruption that you can see, you know, in politics for decades. But I'll tell you, if he ever comes to screen, I've got a perfect actor for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jesse Eisenberg he would be He's great perfect for this character annoyingly yeah. I don't mind Jesse Eisenberg <laughs> I have no problem with him as an actor I really like uh, The Double have you ever seen The Double I with, have uh, yeah Richard Ayoade film yeah. he's a good actor he is. but that wasn't and again we're talking about scripts and Zack Snyder here <laughs> oh, God, but that is not Lex Luthor it was just no. Anyway, Sorry about that. the fact is, these characters here, <laughs> the ones in this comic book, I would gladly read more of. Yes. In fact, I did, because I have got this collected edition here, Superman the Man of Steel, Volume 1. Mm-hmm. You can't see it because my background screen. Here we go. Um, that one, yep. Very good. It collects about 20 or so issues from this era so starts with the man of steel and follows on and i read all of it oh nice i've carried on i just you know i read in addition to what we were meant to be reading i just couldn't put it down so i continued reading and it's got some of uh marv wolfman stuff in here and i really enjoyed this era of superman it mm. seemed like a, a time when they were starting fresh it was great for new readers but it had a more defined version of his origin and what he could do than say the earliest comic books yes yeah. i mean effectively this is how how you update his origin without going too far because obviously there's like a 40 year gap between his first appearance and then this comic but what they're trying to do in this is they're trying to update it for an audience in the 80s which i think that works really well i know uh, we were born at the end of the 80s so we weren't reading comics at, at that age is, is what i'm trying to say we're millennials baby <laughs> i know i hate that we are <laughs> i really hate that we are but i think they do it really well here and again a lot of the building blocks are still there as well mm-hmm like you brought it up in the original film that there's the idea that he pots on his glasses and that's his disguise but it's not because as i said in the original and in this it's explained that pa kent is the one that says oh here clark have my glasses slick your hair back also just stoop down a tad 
mm-hmm. and you look like a brand new person. Yeah. And that's then brought forwards into, well, apart from Zack Snyder's Superman, <laughs> that's brought forwards into this new era of that's why he's not seen as that guy is Superman because it's a nerdy, shy, quiet fool mm-hmm. almost. Yeah. You wouldn't go, that guy looks like, nah, I can't be. You know, I think they even say that in the original film because it's just unbelievable. I, I also like in this, is it this comic where Lex Luthor gets the, it might have been, been the one I read afterwards, but Lex Luthor gets a printout where someone's like, we've worked out the identity of Superman. It's not on this one, but I've seen that panel. Oh, it's it's just after this. And he reads it and basically goes, Clark Kent, no, that's ridiculous. Like, <laughs> he's not going to pretend to be a human and, and he just throws it away. And this is what I like about it is that it gives a believability. I think it might have come in one of the issues after this. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've seen that before. And also I think, there, isn't there a similar one with, Bruce Wayne and Batman, and they use they use a computer to work out Batman. I, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, I tell you what I did find actually quite funny is well, two points. One point's interesting, and one point's funny. Uh, I find it interesting that Clark's dad, so his alien dad, Jor El, mm-hmm. weirdly picks Kansas, America, as the destination point. Yeah, which is just a bit odd and interesting. The bit that I find a bit weird is the fact that Lara, his mum seems to be horrified by a topless farmer it's <laughs> it's just it's oh god oh no <laughs> what it's a topless farmer he's working he's earning a living calm down That's uncouth <laughs> it was just ridiculous but yeah i do find it a bit creepy as well that superman knows where everyone lives yeah there's a couple of bits in there that i could pick out and go that's weird that's odd that's weird that's odd but apart from that it's, it's a really fun comic to read and it's enjoyable and if you know the basics about superman and you read this first six issues i think you've got enough background to work off and the comic helps you along the way that by the end of the sixth issue you'll want to read more which you did i absolutely did and i'd say i think there's about 20 issues in here i read all of those from collected pages of superman man of steel there's some crossover with teen titans i think yeah no i i really enjoyed it i i agree with you i think it is from those first six issues it just made me go oh great you know this is a point of entry for this character this is a so i can read these six issues understand what this version of the character is and it is basically what he should be in my opinion and then it continue from there there are i think three other volumes of superman the man of steel these hardback editions and they're really good size volumes sometimes i bounce off the omnibus editions because they're too big and thick but yeah. this is a nice manageable size and um it's really good i mean i was surprised by how much i enjoyed it yeah i, I really liked it yeah, I mean, I've also commented on the past about the way it's drawn and there's a bit in it that I actually did really like. It's the passage of time, especially when Lois is trying to search for Superman and like four panels show different areas that she's in, yeah. but the text just flows across all four of them. Where someone says, oh, sorry, he was here, but you've just missed him. And it's just the nice little touch of these four different characters just... I'm assuming that they all said the same thing. Yeah. And it just works so well. The little, the dialogue box are running between them. Yeah, I like stuff like that. I also like little bits like, you know, you've got this big Superman origin, you're explaining the character from scratch, and he takes the time to explain how Superman can shave. Yes. It's yeah. just silly stuff like that, where it's like questions, it's like who pumps up the tyres on the Batmobile? People always <laughs> ask these stupid questions. Alfred, I assume? The, well, I'm guessing Alfred. Yeah. It is a stupid question. But the point is, it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> It's a comic book, but I like that it does explain how Superman can shave and stupid stuff like that, as well as the big stuff about how he got his suit, how he's got his powers. Details that is clearly means that this has been written by a fan who has thought about these things. Speaking of little details, have you picked up anything from the films and the comics this week that you want to discuss? I may have done. Well, in that case... Ian's, Ian's egg hunt, Ian's, Ian's egg hunt, Ian's, Ian's egg hunt. I'm not yoking you. Right, so this being a 50th special extraordinaire, I thought I'd do the exact same thing that I always did. <laughs> um, and, um, <laughs> right, I'll start with Man of Steel, because yeah. um, there wasn't a lot that I could find in Superman, the original, but I'll get onto that. Okay. So in Man of Steel, the film, there's Lex Corp's logos throughout the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's one on that oil truck that you mentioned earlier on that explodes. Yeah. You know, just to hammer home that Lex is a bad person that is trying to explode, <laughs> so I assume. But LexCorp isn't the only company sign that's in this film. You've got Star Labs on a building. You've got Wayne Enterprises on a satellite. Mm -hmm. All these little 
small tidbits and a bunch more as well. Yeah. The Colonel's call sign is Guardian, which could be a reference to the DC character. Mm-hmm. It might not be, but Easter eggs are Easter eggs, so yeah. that's what you're getting. <laughs> there may also be a reference to a different DC character in this. Yeah. A female major. She's the one who says that Spider-Man is kind of hot. Superman. Uh, she's called... Sorry, yep, Superman's kind of hot. She, the stupidest woman in the world. <laughs> Go on, why? <laughs> well, she, there's a bit where the, someone's explaining about terraforming and she goes, wait, what's terraforming? <laughs> and then oh, yeah. they explain what terraforming is to her and she then goes, but what'll happen to us? And then everyone looks really dramatic. And me and Hayley were sitting there going, what the fuck? How did she get this job? <laughs> yeah, why is she? Why is she in the who army? Who is this idiot who is, doesn't understand what well, terraforming is? Anyway, who is she? This idiot is called Carrie Farris, mm. uh, which could be a nod to Carol yes. Farris, Green Lantern's other half. Mm-hmm. Just again, could be. And there's a fishing boat uh, at the start of this called the Debbie Sue. It could be that Zack Snyder put that in, or it could be named after his wife, Deborah. Gotcha. This, this stuff hasn't been confirmed. It's just me that I've gone, look, 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 the thing, the thing on the TV. I, I... Debbie Sue, that must mean something. <laughs> oh, my God. But yeah, you brought this up kind of earlier on with our little whinge about Man of Steel when <laughs> in both films... Critical review of Man of Steel. <laughs> uh... Okay, yeah, that, we'll, we'll go with that. kal birth ship is very different in the two films. Mm-hmm. But in Man of Steel, when you got that PowerPoint of Krypton, yeah. you do see that kal ship is shown with very, very similar spikes to the ship in the 78 film. That's cool. I quite like that. I preferred the aesthetic of the original 1978 film. I did, again, another thing Hayley and I both laughed at was um, when Zod and that are sent into the Phantom Zone, <laughs> the shape of their... I know exactly the, what you're The shape say. of their ships, the, the little birth pods they get put in is... Um, uh, yep. I mean, it's a dildo. Phallic. It's very phallic. <laughs> yes. it's space dildos. All stuck in those space dildos with balls and everything. Oh... <laughs> uh. Yep, yeah, oh god, yeah. I, I, I did write, write that down, but I didn't know where to put it in. <laughs> <laughs> Just massive space dildos. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, um, speaking of both films, Lana Lang, mm-hmm. so Clark's high school friend slash girlfriend, depends on what you read or watch, yep. is in both films. In Superman, she invites Clark to a party after the sports game. <laughs> Go sports. <laughs> the sports game. Sports game. And then in Man of Steel, she's one of the classmates on the bus that crashes into the water. Yeah. And then, because I wrote that prior to reading the, the Man of Steel comic, mm-hmm. she's then in issue six of Man of Steel. Yes. Which just appears out of nowhere. And then apparently Clark's told her all about him that he forgot about this. But... Well, she's a, her childhood sweetheart. But um, I don't know if you, if you got this Easter egg for later about Lana Lang from Superman. Uh, no, I've got one more Easter egg. And okay. Then, but yeah, go on. What's for Lana Lang? Well, she went on to play Martha Kent in Smallville, I think. Oh, well, yeah. No, I, yeah, I knew that, but I didn't write it down. <laughs> okay. Because, yeah, I think I watched, when I was watching Smallville back in the day, I was like, ah, oh, let's just do a little bit of internet searchy searchy. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I forgot about that. Actually, talking about actors that have been in Superman 78. Okay. There was an actor who appears in both films that we have critically talked about, whatever you said today. Critically? Um, yeah, go on. Which two? His name is Aaron Solosky. So I'm probably saying that wrong. Mm-hmm. He played Baby Clark in the 78 film and yeah. then plays a communications officer in Man of Steel. Oh. He's just in the background. It'd be He's... weird if it was the other way around. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, great CGI work there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I just I thought there'd be someone in there that's, that's been in both films and it turns out to be him. Yeah, I suppose that most of the original, and sadly, most of the original main cast are dead by now. So um, yeah, yeah, they uh, sort of didn't have many opportunities to do that. A lot of them appeared in Smallville. Mm. So I know Christopher Reeves did, for instance, but um, yeah, yeah. Anywho. Yeah, there you go. There's a bunch more in there, but I don't sit through here and go for all of them because that would take a long, long time. It would take a long time. And uh, I mean, this is our Superman size special, so you've got time if you want it. Oh, well, in that case, <laughs> have a seat. <laughs> All right. You know, any fun facts you want to throw at me this week? I've already thrown my fun fact to you, I think. That'll do me. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Uh, so let's get back to the conclusion and wrap things up, shall we? So let's start with 1978 Superman. Let's do these in the order we spoke about them. What were your overall thoughts very briefly? Very, very fun. Still holds up today. Couple of the effects 
a little bit like I was watching Red Dwarf, <laughs> that kind of like toy that blows up kind of thing. Red Dwarf was made 20 years after this. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I know. But I mean, think they do that for a joke. But this is kind of like this is what they had at the time. Yeah. But yeah, overall enjoyed it. Very wholesome, very family fun, very Superman. This is to me what Superman is. Absolutely. And it works. Yeah. Yourself? I, I completely agree. I enjoyed it a great deal. It's not flawless. Obviously, it's kind of goofy. And yeah, we can sit here and, and pick holes in the effects. But, you know, shock horror, 44-year-old film, doesn't always have modern effects, is not a great criticism. So generally speaking, I sat down two hours, couple of beers, laughed a lot, and I believed a man could fly. It was great. Oh, wow. The tagline did not lie. Well, it turns out they also use that tagline for Man of Steel as well. So oh, God. did it lie for that? <laughs> yeah. Really? I think they lengthened it by saying, you will believe that a man can fly, which is very much the approach to the film, in my opinion, is making things more verbose for no reason. <laughs> what were your thoughts on Superman? Sorry. What were your thoughts on Man of Steel 2013? It's just a bit meh. It's just overly long. Or at least it feels overly long. And yeah, like I, said, like I said before, I was hoping for it to end. <laughs> oh, I did enjoy, um, didn't really touch on him. I did enjoy Russell Crowe yeah. as uh, Jor-El or as I kept calling him, Ghost Dad. He's a, he's a ghost and yeah. I liked the bit where he's guiding her through the ship and he's always, he looks like a, an NPC from a video game. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, <laughs> this way. Oh, I turn and shoot. Now that door. <laughs> Bye. It's like yeah. That is that's how you train in like any game. But yeah, you? yeah. I, I, like I said, I didn't think the cast was the problem here. I think the problem is it's not just a bad Superman film. It's a bad film. Yes. It's long and loud. It's ponderous and poorly paced. That said, it's still probably in the top half of DCEU's output, but um, <laughs> it's, it's certainly the best Zack Snyder film. So I mean, mm. I'll give it that. Wow. Oh, actually, just you said you said cast there. Lara, so Kal El's mum, is played by the actress who was Vanessa in uh, Daredevil. Oh, that's comic book crossover. Yeah. yeah. And did you know Kal El's birth dad played Zeus in Thor: <laughs> Love and Thunder? <laughs> I still haven't seen oh, it because okay. I've not been very well this week. And prior to that, I was very very poor, so I had to wait to payday. Fair enough. And I got paid, and then I got ill. So uh, hopefully, you see, it, you see it at some point. Please send your donations to. <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about Action Comics and Superman number one then. So what were your thoughts on those? I mean, Action Comics, Superman number one, you could kind of put them together. I think Action Comics number one is worth a read. It's 17 pages. Took me 10 minutes. Like, if you've got a coffee break to take at work or bag break or whatever, you're on a bus going somewhere, just read it. Like, I know I shouldn't really be saying this, but you can get it online for free anyway. Yeah. It's such a <laughs> such an easy comic to find that yeah, it's enjoyable. Yeah, we don't expect you to just pay a million pounds oh, no. to buy the original copy. Yeah, just please. just contact um, Nick Cage. There we yeah, go. Nick I'll, Cage I'll has got a copy. <laughs> if you want to hear more about him, go back to our Kickass episode and hear a little story that Ian tells. <laughs> Self promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Good work. But yeah, so I think Superman number one is just an extension of Action Comics, uh, like we said. It's, yeah. It's still fun, still enjoyable, still got the actual blocks of the character, mm -hmm. just a little bit more fleshed out and very of the time comic. Yeah. So you need to keep that in mind when you read it. I agree. I think they're fun little curios, but they are not essential reading by any stretch. I think if you're going to read one or the other, read Superman number one, because it includes most of the stuff from Action Comics number one. Mm -hmm. But like Ian says, they are all available online. They're worth a read if you've got a toilet break and uh, <laughs> and, and you've got five, because they won't take long to read. They are not text heavy. They really won't. Moving on to The Man of Steel by John Byrne. What were your thoughts of that? The Steely Man. I thought it was very, very interesting, actually. Uh, like I said, going in with weird expectations of the time, of comics of the 80s. But no, I, yeah, enjoyed it thoroughly. Didn't mm. realise that they did books like... Well, I didn't... I would have assumed they did. They have got a book like you've got. Yep. That's something that I might have to get at some point and put it on my shelf and not ever read. <laughs> no, um, I think it would be interesting for me to read the rest of that. Yeah. I think they've got four volumes of this now, which continues the story as well. And, and each one's about 20 issues long, as I say. I think a generally enjoyable cliff note retelling of Superman's early years. Yes. It does skip over a huge amount uh, and it is fairly episodic. Each issue is fairly self-contained. But if you are starting Superman from scratch, I think this is as good a jumping on point as you can get. 
And on that note, actually, I was on a bit of a Superman kick by this point. So I also picked up Superman Smashes the Clan by Jin Leon Yang and Guri Hiru. Right. And I also reread All Star Superman by Grant Morrison and Frank Quitely. Superman Smashes the Clan is first time I've read that. It's a recent comic loosely based on a story from the old Adventures of Superman radio show. So it is set in post-World War II America. Mm -hmm. It is based on the old Superman, so it's when he couldn't fly, he would run along telephone wires to get places. And it is excellent. It is a a story, as it sounds, about Superman beating up the Ku Klux Klan. Brilliant. Wow. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I mean, they're called the Church of the Fiery Cross or something, or the Clan of the Fiery Cross. But but Yeah, it's on the nose, isn't it? (laughs) Bloody loved it. It was great. Really good story. Um, Great jumping on point as well. It does actually work really well as jumping on point for Superman as well. And All-Star Superman by Grant Morrison and Frank Whiteley is genuinely my favourite Superman story of all time. One of my favourite comic books of all time. If you want a love letter to Superman, if you want to know what Superman can be and is, that's the story to read. But yes, I I mean, as I say, I'm probably going to pick up the rest of the Man of Steel volumes at some point. They are, they're really good. Cool. And we've got two films to ask about. What was Kate's quick opinion of Superman 1978? What's not to love? I don't know. What was her opinion of them though? Haha, <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Oh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's fun. It's good. What's not to love? Fair enough. And the big question, what was her opinion of the Man of Steel? It's all right. In that kind of tone, it's all right. <laughs> like, all right. <laughs> like, yeah, it's a film. <laughs> Very different reactions there. I think she liked it more than both of us, though. So, yeah, um, well, I think because I don't think she's seen it before. I honestly don't know. And as we know, it's been documented that she does not like Batman v Superman. No. She's just punch, punch. Here's a kitchen sink, punch. Yeah. Throw a wall, punch. So, yeah, the last half an hour, she was bored. Yeah. But yeah, there's bits that she liked about it. That's why it was yeah, all right. Like Yeah. I mean Haley no, nah, Haley didn't like it, but um, <laughs> Yeah, so I was gonna say she kinda of thought it was right, but no, she didn't. It was it wasn't good. Especially and we both enjoyed Superman seventy eight, so that's good. Yes. Right, well, that's all for our 50th episode, our Superman size special, if you will. If you liked it, then why not crash land onto Planet Subscribe? And if you enjoy your stay, then feel free to drop a five star rating. Next episode, we shift tone as we go from Superman to Conman, while still staying within the wider DC universe. Join us as we pick up some dangerous habits in the pages of Hellblazer and watch how they massacred my boy for the screen with Constantine. Or should that be Constantine? I don't know. Should it? No. Or should that be Constantine? I don't know. Should it? No. No. Okay. Well. No, it should be Constantine. How do they pronounce it in Legends of Tomorrow? Constantine, I think. John Constantine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's Constantine. Also, I'm going to make you watch a whole season of Constantine. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you want to pick me one episode of John Constantine from all of those things. Um, no, the TV show Constantine is terrible, but the actor who plays him, Matt, someone in my. Matt be- Ryan? Yeah, Matt Ryan. He does a really good portrayal of the character yeah but his series was just slated and it got cut and mm. whatever but um they brought him back for legends of tomorrow and he's a really good actor to play that character but more on that next week i guess we'll talk about this next it feels like a next week conversation right join us then for constantine constantine <laughs>